But uh, no, I'll open up a word of prayer and all the other preachers can just jump right into it. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for this time of being here, Lord. Thankful for this church. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the preachers, Lord. Help us not to do uh, things with dirty hands, Lord. Cleanse our hands, cleanse our heart, cleanse our mind, Lord. Help us to speak forth the truth, Lord. Be thankful for Brother Hernandez and the, the effort and the travel and all the things that he's put into this church already, Lord. I pray, God, that these people would get a blessing out of it, Lord. Thankful also that he didn't preach my message. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, be in it and you put me out of the way, Lord, and fill me with your spirit. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> All right, the Bible says in verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto, unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of, the, out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such things as turn aside uh, to lies. Verse 5, Many, O Lord my God, are, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thou thoughts, sh uh, thou thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. And if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than, than, than can be numbered. You could say amen right there. Amen. That's, that's, that's fact. Verse 6, sacrifice and offering thou uh, didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou uh, hast thou not required. Then said I, I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the congregation. Lo, I have, lo, I, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. And I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thy tender mercies from me, O Lord, thy uh, let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have come past me about mine iniquities. Have thou taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up, and they are more than, than, than the hairs of mine head. Therefore my heart failed me. But be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, and make haste to help me. Let them, be, let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. And let them be driven backward, to put them to shame. Thou wish me evil. Let them be desolate for a reward of their shame, that they say me, aha and aha. Let all those that seek thee uh, rejoice and be glad in thee. Uh, let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord is magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord rethinketh upon me. Thou art mine help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. You know, there's a testimony there. And I, I'm thinking, in, I'm sitting in the pew thinking about what to preach. I cleaned out my Bible. I got nothing to preach. But it's always good to write a sermon down in the Bible because this is my testimony here. And it's a testimony message. It's a testimony of a deliverance by God's power. The Bible says in verse 1, he says, He heard, he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He inclined them. God heard the cry of the Israelites in Exodus chapter 3 and came to their rescue. The Bible says in Exodus 3, 7, the Lord, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by a reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Have you ever cried before? Have you ever cried out to God? There's a lot of lost people out there, and I'm afraid that lost people today are not crying. They enjoy their sin. They love their sin. They're not even aware of the bondage and the chains and the afflictions they're in. They won't, get, they won't be saved because they, won't realize, they don't realize they are lost. David knew he was lost. He said, Lord, he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He knew that there's something in his life that needed to be changed. Yeah, yeah. And there was a time in your life that something needed to change and you, yeah. were, you swept it by. You didn't even want to pass. You just didn't want nothing to do with it. But there was a day when you trusted Jesus Christ and you said, no more. Get me out of it. And just like this, he says, en enough's enough. In verse 2, he talks about um, the change. He says in verse 2, he brought me up out of a horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. You know, there's a change that's going to be need to be made. And Brother Robert knows that change. There was a change in my life where I knew nothing, no, no stability, no foundation of life, no, no Jesus Christ, the Savior, just lost as the world can be. Amen. And, you know, what's sad to say is that just it's so it's amazing to think about what 10 years can do. 
I've been, late, I've been saved 16 years, but I'm just going off 10 years. Those six years, I was stupid. But those 10 years have changed drastically. We were visiting my sister, my sister having a baby shower, and I'm looking at that, and I'm looking at her, all of her friends and everything all coming over, and they're drinking, they're partying, they're having a good old time, and I'm just, and I said, this is not for me. Yeah. I look, I'm like, where's my wife, man? My wife's all by herself sitting up on a swing, and I'm like, this is my crowd right here. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not into this party. I'm not into this. There's, 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 there's a cry in my life, and there was a change, and I thank God there was a change. I cannot be saved and still doing the things that, 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 that they're doing. I can't do that. And God forbid you shouldn't either. He said he, there's a change. He says, uh, out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay. God took him out of the pit and out of the miry clay, and God doesn't leave his sheep in a mud hole when he finds them in one. When David cried, God brought him out. The Bible says in Psalms 34, verse 6, the poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The Bible says in, one, in Psalms 107, verse 28, then they cry unto the Lord uh, in their trouble and bringeth them out of their distress. There's two illustrations in that. God took Noah out of the world, God's people out of the, uh, Noah's people out of the world and put him into an ark. And God took Israel out of Egypt. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, and ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Yes. There's a change that's going to be made. I'm not just going to take you out of the pit and say, here you go, you're on your own. Yes. No, he says, there's going to be something that's going to be changing from this for. Don't go back to that slot. And you shouldn't go back to that slot. No, that's, good. that's a terrible Christian. Yes. That's a bad dog Amen. right there. <laughs> God brings his people out. The Bible says in Isaiah verse 42, verse 7, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You didn't just become some stupid American. You became a royal priesthood. You're... You're up there with King Henry now, man. No, you're just, you're, you're, you're separate. You're a priest. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Amen. You ought to act like it. You ought to dress like it. You ought to prepare like it. Amen. The Bible says you know, that there's not only a, a cry, a change. Lastly, there's a confidence. He set my feet upon a rock. And thank God he set me on a rock. He didn't set me on Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And say, you got to do all of this. And no, he set me on Jesus Christ. The ground, the pillar of the truth. The Bible says in uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 3, Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, and for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Amen. You can't say it on anybody else, man. Yes. David referred to God as his rock on multiple occasions. You think of 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 to 3, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this, saint, this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies yes. and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress Amen. and my deliverer, my, the God of, of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. And it jumps down to verse 32, For who is God? Save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. There's no one like you. You say, well, he's a rock. Peter's nothing like Jesus Christ. If you looked at the Bible, you would see a complete difference. And it's not anything. The Bible says, we sing that song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know, you sing that whole, yeah, the whole song. And I have a terrible voice, but... If Josh Stevenson was here, he'd sing it. But that's the rock right there. The solid rock. And you know that, that there's a change. And lastly, very lastly, the course. He said he established my goings. He didn't just say he heard my cry and put a change in my heart. He gave me a course. He gave me a course. He set me out. He established everything before me. But God came by and David was going nowhere. He just existed. He was trapped in a pit in a mud hole and it was a horrible existence. It was a filthy existence. And God came to where he was and he changed him and gave him a purpose for living. God came my way and a little punk 11-year-old t-shirt kid with a rock and roll came to shorts to church and wearing uh, skater shoes and long hair and just 
Didn't care nothing about the religious thing. Amen. Nothing. I didn't care. Okay, I knew one. I knew God existed. He was on the dollar bill. Woohoo! That's all he was. He was. He was that. He was that to me. I didn't care. God says, no, there's something else that he has. Yeah. And he starts giving me a family. He gives me, gives me a salvation. And he says, you know, I want, I want something to do with you. I don't want just to save you. I want to yeah. use you. Amen. And God wants to use you too in this church. Build this church. Make this church big, man. Yeah. It's yours. Do it. Amen. You know, he says the course. He says, uh, God came to where he was and he changed him and gave him a purpose for living. And you have a purpose for living. The lost world are seeking after a purpose. They think it's a 401k. They think it's a big fancy house off of, off of San Francisco. They think it's a nice Tesla to drive. It, it's not. You keep going after that, that purpose, you're going to find yourself back in the mud hole. David's going was established. Dave, God's people are going to heaven. God's people are going to church. And David says, you know what? I've got, he gave me a course. He says, I, I have a, how, um, he says, I am glad when they said they came to go to church. I was glad. He said, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. God's people ought to be going into all the world. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto him, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What are you doing with God giving you out of that miry clay? What are you doing when, 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 when God's changed you? What are you doing that God's heard your cry and you just let it go and you become it numb and it's no big deal? I'll tell you one thing. When Daisy starts crying, I'm not numb to it. I gravitate towards it. And that's how Lord Jesus Christ is with your crying. He's off thinking Sean won't stop crying. <laughs> no, he says, Sean's crying. Hold on. Shop the world. Yeah, amen. amen. And you know, he doesn't just numb to it. So what are you doing about that cry? What are you doing about that change in the course that he's doing for you? Do something about it. Yeah, amen. amen. All right, so before I say what I'm getting ready to say, and I promise I'm not crying when I say this. Not yet. I might cry. Um, I just, I want you to know I was going somewhere completely different when I was preparing this message. And also, Brother Anthony took my spot. Amen? And, and, and he said he had nothing prepared, right? No message, right? Okay, just remember that. Remember that. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Sorry, let me get this going. All right, come on, guys. I'll tell you this. I was about to start crying. I wasn't ready to come up here after Pastor Fernandez's message. I wasn't, brother. I, I thought I was about to pass out, man. I was trembling. Remember the first time you got up and preached at us, preacher? You said you were trembling? Yeah. I'm trembling, brother. Because I think I got something from God. And... And I'm going to do my best to give it to you. All right? Second right? Samuel chapter 11. And I need you, I need you guys, I need your help. I need you to remember those two messages you just heard. Don't think this is like channel changed and you're on to Sean now. This is from the Lord. This is the same thing. It goes hand in hand. So Second Samuel chapter 11. And I want you to look at verse 14. The Bible says in Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 14. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. So now you and I, we know what happened before this between David and Bathsheba. I need you to Forget all of that right now. I'm focusing on Uriah today. I want to talk about Uriah. And Uriah, in this passage, has just hand-delivered his own death sentence. I don't know if you know that. And we, we know that where the word of a king is, there is power. Amen? So this thing is done. This thing is signed, sealed, delivered. Uriah is living in the last days of his earthly ministry. While he's unaware of the evil conspiracy, as a professional warrior of God, he is certain that he's living in perilous times. Uriah, as a type of the Christian soldier, in the last days of his fight of faith, will soon finish his course. We all want to make it to the rapture, amen? Amen. I mean, we talk about it, we sing about it, we scream about it, we throw stuff about it. Amen. We, we look for it. Amen. 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 
But when I look around at this present evil world, I see that the perilous times of the last days of the church age that we're living in, it, it's, I, don't, I don't know if I would say it's probable, likely, I don't know what, but chances are not everyone in this room is going to make it to the rapture. Some of us today might, be, uh, might have uh, in, in our back pockets a divine sentence written by the Lord, written by our King of death. And I don't know about you, but if it's me, I want to go out like this guy. I want to go out like a Uriah. Amen? I want to finish my course like Uriah did. So I need you guys to remember that you just heard about the captain, the cry, the change, the confidence, the course. And today I want to tell you about the contents of Uriah's character. The contents of Uriah's character. Heavenly Father, please set a watch at my mouth, Lord. Please just take total control. Uh, please uh, ha have the words that are about to be preached find their ways into to nice, soft ground like Brother Ralph was talking about. And just have your perfect will with it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The contents of Uriah's character. Turn the page to 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12. And in 2 Samuel 12, I want you to look at verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in, the, in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had, brought, uh, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Number one, I want to tell you that Uriah was content with who he had in his life. He was content with who he had in his life. That word content means literally held. Contained within limits. Hence, quiet. Not disturbed. Having a mind at peace. Still, satisfied so as not to repine, object, or oppose. Poor Uriah had nothing save one little you lamb. Your, la your heavenly lamb had everything save one little you lamb. Wow. Uriah bought and nourished up his little you lamb. Your lamb bought you and nourishes you. Uriah's lamb grew up together with him and with his children, but you and your family grew up together with him. Uriah's lamb did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. Your lamb sacrificed his own eternal body and blood for you, and he drank of the cup of the wrath of God that belonged to you and I. You content today, Christian? Uriah's lamb lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. As a daughter. That's a good verse for pet owners, by the way. Not going to make me feel bad about calling my uh, dog my daughter. <laughs> Your lamb, the only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, had the beloved apostle John leaning on his bosom in John 13. The same John who later wrote in 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You're not as a son to that lamb. You are literally a son of God. So Christian, if poor Uriah could live content with nothing save his one little ewe lamb, why can't you? Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Why? For he, the lamb, hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uriah's lamb was stolen from him. Uriah had to leave his beloved lamb. Uriah fought and died alone and away from his lamb. So what in the world is stopping you today from living and dying peacefully and satisfied in the bosom of your lamb? The Bible says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Number two, Uriah was content with who he was in life. Who he was. Look back at 2 Samuel uh, 11 at, and look at verse 16. 
2 Samuel 11, verse 16, it says, And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. You know, I look around this room, I see a place where there's valiant men and women. I see a place where people are going through some things. They're in a battle. They've been through some stuff. Amen? Amen. Uriah wasn't concerned with the details. He wasn't consumed with having to know what was in the letter he, or why he was sent in the forefront of the hottest battle with the toughest enemies. He was content as a faithful soldier of Jesus Christ to simply follow orders because that's who Uriah was. The Bible says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. I'm talking about being content. Some things that will hold you together. When the letter comes and it's not, I'm going to deliver you, it's die. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. The Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. Fighters fight. Amen, preacher? Fighters fight. Preachers preach. Singers sing. Prayers pray. You know what Christians do real well throughout history? They die. They die really well. They die a lot better than the lost. You want an example? Reverend E. Payson's joyful experiences in triumph and death. He was asked by a friend if he could see any particular reason for this dispensation. Amen? Amen. Uh, Dispensation of death, I should have called that. Yeah. He replied, no, but I am as well satisfied as if I could see 10,000 reasons. In a letter dictated to his sister, he writes, were I to adopt the figurative language of Bunyan, I might date this letter from the land of Beulah of which I have been for some time such a happy inhabitant. The celestial city is full in view. Its its, its glories beam upon me. Its breezes fan me. Its odors are wafted to me. He wasn't flat-nosed, preacher. Its sounds strike upon my ears, and its spirit is breathed into my heart. Nothing separates me from it but the river of death, which now appears as an insignificant rill, which can be crossed at a single step. Whenever God shall give permission, the Son of Righteousness has been gradually drawing nearer and nearer, appearing larger and brighter as He approached, and now fills the whole hemisphere, pouring forth a flood of glory in which I seem to float like an insect in the beams of the sun, exulting yet almost trembling while I gaze on this excessive brightness and wondering why God should deign thus to shine upon a sinful worm. Number three, he was content with what he had to give. His life. You know what the name Uriah means? It means Jehovah is my light. Uriah went out like uh, John the Baptist, amen, a burning and a shining light to everyone else on the battlefield that day. Turn to Psalm 27 and we'll be done. Psalm 27. Uriah went out there on the battlefield that day thinking he was going to get a victory, thinking he was going to get delivered, amen, only to have his cl- the, the people closest to him turn their backs on him, leave him to, leave him to die alone, right? That's how the world would see it, but that's not how Uriah saw it. Forsaken by man, compassed about by the enemy, I wonder if he cried out to God something like what you'll find in Psalm 27. In verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple." For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock, and now shall mine head be lifted up 
above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Uriah, he went out. How I pray that we'll go out. Some of us in here might have that divine sentence where the Lord wants us to die. And it's not for us to question it. It's not for, that's not our role. We're not king. We're soldiers. We follow orders. Amen? So I pray that we all hit the rapture. Lord knows I do. But if we don't, if some of you got to stand by my, my hospital bed, if I got to stand by your hospital bed, I pray that you'll say that prayer that, that that preacher did. I pray that you'll get the visions of glory and you'll get the victory the way Uriah got the victory. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm I gotta ask for a little bit of grace here. I, I can't put on a suit, I'm sorry. Uh, I did my best, this is the best I could do right now. All right, do I need to put the mic on or do I, do I leave it on there? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. I was sweating yesterday and I, it's not for the reason what, what you think it is. Uh, I was sweating because Pastor, Pastor Fernandez actually used a set of verses that I'm gonna use. I'm gonna talk about Jacob. Uh, let's turn to Genesis 28. Jacob, as we heard yesterday, is quite a man, and he's a swindler. I believe, I see him as an intellectual, by the way. Uh, perhaps like how some of the, uh, a little like me, uh, <laughs> some people who, he's, because he's really smart. He's smart at scanning people. He's smart at planning behind people's backs and being subtle. That's how he fooled his father. I mean, he went along with it with Rebecca, but why, why did he do that? He had the... Ability to say no. He was smart enough. I think he was old enough to say, Mom, I think that's a bad idea. Yeah. Lo and behold, he just went along with it and he said, no, Maybe I can just get the blessing and I could just get away and blame it on my mom and run away. That's what I'm going to talk about right now. Genesis 28, let's read verse 10. The Bible says, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. All right, look. The prevailing theme with Jacob in his life is he's always running, yeah. he's running from something. Pastor Fernandez hit on that yesterday. He's running. And the, and the reason why he's running is caused by himself. He's the reason why he's running. It's, in a way, it's almost like he's running from himself. Right? Let's, let's go to Genesis 31, 20. Uh, and then right before, after we read this, I'm going to pray real quick before I actually get into it. Um, Genesis 31, verse 20. Again, it says... And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian in that he told him not that he fled. He snuck away without telling somebody because he was afraid. He was running from Laban. Probably because of something he did. If you if don't have a guilty conscience, why are you running? What is he running for? What is he running from? He's afraid of something because he probably did something. Again, he was a scammer. He was a conniver. He probably did something behind his back. All right, let me pray real quick. Heavenly Father, please set me aside and use me only as a vessel for your glory. And I pray that none of my words will come out and that only your words will come out of my mouth. And that you'll cleanse us from all, any, any and all sins we've committed. And that you'll help us to be in a mind that is attentive and that can pay attention to your message, Lord. pray all this in Jesus Christ's almighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, so Jacob ran from a lot of things and he was the cause of it. You might have done the same thing. You cause a problem and you're running away from it because you can't find a way to solve it. And what do we do? What we should do is we take it to God, but instead we ignore whatever problem that we've caused and we just run away and we forget about it. Yeah, you're right. The natural human response to threat is to run or to fight, right? Yeah. We're, we either, we see something that's so big and scary and we either think, okay, well, okay, let's say it's a bear. Do I have a gun? Can I shoot it? Okay, no, I don't. I, I better run, right? Because you're not going to go at a bear with your bare hands. I hope not, unless you have no choice. But <laughs> that's kind of scary, right? 
But generally speaking, most people tend to run. Uh -huh. I tend to run. When I get scared of something, I tend to run. And the Bible says you should be scared and run away from some things, like some sins that you yeah, probably yeah, can't beat. Right. You, you yeah. ought to run. Yeah. But you're not supposed to run away from some fights. Some things that's are right. worth being fought for. Yeah. Your, your Christian faith is something that's worth fighting for. It's not something to run away from. No. And you might be doing that with Jake, just like Jacob. Maybe some of you right now are running away from something. So right now, you might be running away from some spiritual duties. You might be running away from a problem in your family. You might be running away from a problem in your own life that you caused. You might be running away from addressing a sin that you're, you're committing. I don't know what it is. And by the way, I've never, I don't think I've ever gotten the trembles while I was pre preparing something. This is one. Uh, you might be running right now. And you might just be hoping right now that some, some preacher is not going to preach against whatever you're thinking about. That's good preaching. Something, something's in the back That's of your mind, preaching. and it's just hoping. There's this small voice saying, oh, Lord, please let it not be that thing. Let me just, yeah. let, let me just hide today. I know I'm going to get preached out about something, but I, I pray that you're not going to hit on the thing that I'm thinking about. You might be running from God right now. Today. You might have been running yesterday. And you might continue to run right now. And I pray that's not the case. I pray that you don't run away from God today and that throughout the whole day, we have a couple more hours left, amen? Yeah, yeah. I pray that you take the time to take whatever things you got to settle with God and that you don't run away from this altar and you don't yeah. run away from whatever God has to tell you. Sooner or later, he's going to come for you. Yeah, yeah. You think you can run away from God? Oh, he's right next to you. In fact, he's inside your heart if you're saved. Yeah. He's sitting there and he's saying, well, how long are you going to run from me, son? Yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm right next to you. It's like you're trying to run away from somebody in a car. He's driving next to you. He's saying, son, how long are you going to run from me? I'm right next to you. I need you to listen to me. Don't try to run. But Jacob was a runner. My first point is that running solves no problems. Maybe Jacob shouldn't have participated in the plans of his mother. Believe it or not, in the case that your parents aren't saved, or maybe even when they are saved, they might not always have the best intentions for you, be, for whatever reason. Now, I'm not saying don't honor your parents. I'm not saying your parents are wrong. You ought to obey your parents as long as it is not something that is obviously sinful and against the Bible. But they might not always have your best interest in heart. And Rachel definitely did not have Jacob's best interest in heart with this plan. He was old enough to decide, but he decided to follow along with it because he, he decided maybe he'll just get really nice profits out of it. And he did, but he also paid a consequence, which I will mention later. Before you run, you, you, might, under, you might want to understand that even though Esau was planning to kill Jacob, I have a feeling maybe when Isaac was still alive, if Jacob had taken to Esau, maybe Esau wouldn't have killed Jacob in front of Isaac because he planned in his heart that he's going to do it after the days of mourning, right? Maybe if he had tried to settle things while Isaac was still alive, it could have turned out a little differently. Yeah. I don't know. I was just reading, uh, I was reading about Esau's descendants and I was like, these are the very people that Jacob's people are going to be enemies with. That was sad. Yeah. I was like, Amalek. I was like, oh, I know that name. You know, <laughs> I know that name. That's not a good name. And it came from Esau. Maybe it could, things could have turned out differently, but Jacob ran away. Yeah. But Jacob ran. You might be at odds with, uh, with God for some reason. By the way, when you run away from somebody that's angry, you only make them angrier. I'm telling you the truth. When I was young, let me tell you, when I was a Catholic boy, nine years old, I am not proud of this. I'm telling you for, as an illustration. My brother would tease me and he would run away. He loved doing that. He just, got, he was like the joy of his life. It, it was a thrill to him and I hated him for it. In fact, I, I just thought, if I could get my hands, I'm going to kill that guy. You know, that's what I was thinking. In that Catholic church parking lot, when he did that, I got so angry, I started yelling profanities. Trust me, the la my language was so colorful, I would have fit in right with the United States Army. I'm, I'm telling you right now. I could have been in the Marine Corps, and they would have been like, hey, welcome. You know? <laughs> I like your language, boy. <laughs> it was bad. You know, I was like, you blanketed blank, how dare you blanketed blank, run away from you blank, 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 blank. It's, it was X-rated language, but, but I was nine years old. How wicked, is, how wicked is that? How wicked is that? In fact, a Catholic Sunday school teacher came up to me and it was like, Tom, 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 hey, hey, 
you're not, you're not, you shouldn't say things like that. We're at God's house. And I was like, but this blankety blank, he ran away from me. Listen, if you run away from somebody who's angry, he's only going to get angrier. If God is angry at you and you run away from him, you're only going to make him more angry towards you. Why run when you can just take it to him? He's not going to kill you, right? Of oh, worst case, he might kill you if you're really bad, but he's probably not going to kill you if he's trying to deal, you, deal with you as he does with his sons. So run towards him. Don't run away from him. Don't be like Jacob. Look, you might be here just because it's a revival. Or, God forbid, you think that just because somebody might think that it's weird that you're not here, that's why you're here. I hope you're not running away from God like that. You're here because of some other reason other than hearing what God has to tell you and you're here just for the sake of it. I don't want you to be here like that because then you're just running away from God. You're not getting anything out of this. What's the point of you being here if you're not here to listen to God? You're running from him, but you're not physically running. You're mentally and spiritually running away from him. You're doing that without, you don't even have to, to show it. it might, you might be doing that right now. I pray that's not the case. You got to get things settled. That's why you're here. That's why we're here. All right, so the, re the rest of the day is a good chance to get right. Point number two, running will not prevent your chastisement from happening. It doesn't solve any problems. Your consequences will come. If you sin, you're going to reap it. You're going to reap more than you sow. You're gonna, it's, sin is unfair. Yeah. When pastor taught about that, that was, that was a scary teaching. Uh, but that was a very eye-opening one. You're going to reap. Yes. If you know that you're going to reap, you might as well just reap now and not run away from it. That's because right. it's going to keep building. Look, I, am, I imagine sin, sin being some sort of a compound interest account. Now, I know that sounds really nerdy, but think of it this way. <laughs> Think of it this way. You sin once, that sin, that sin compounds. Let's say it increases by 10%. Next time it increases by 20%, and then it keeps going up and up, and the interest keep adding up. And before you, before you know it, the thing is a mountain. You can't settle it now. Now you have to pay a lot more than you had before. It's like you're loading out your spiritual life to a loan shark called the devil, and then you're expecting to be unscathed when you come back. You can't keep running from your problems. It won't do you any good. Or right, let's see what happens to Jacob. All right. In Genesis 31, verses, uh, let's see, verses 38 to 42. Ja I think this is the most ironic thing ever in the Bible. All right. This is Jacob telling Laban of all his ill treatment of him. Okay, let's read this. This 20 years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flocks have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee, I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst, th didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was, in the day in the, in the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed, changed my wages ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hast, thou hast sent me away now empty. God hath seen, of mine, seen mine affliction, and the labor of my hands, and rebuked thee yesternight. And he didn't even consider what Esau had to go through, okay? Yeah. This is what's so ironic to me. Yeah. Look, okay. What was this a consequence of? Of Jacob running away. Yeah. If he hadn't ran away, I don't know. Maybe yeah. things would have been different. I don't know because the Bible's written this way, okay? But maybe it could have been different. All right, what happens to Jacob as a result? In Genesis 32, 25, he loses one functioning leg. I lost one functioning arm. You know how hard it is to live my life with one arm? It, it can be a little difficult, okay? Lord's been really good to me. I'm not, I'm not saying anything otherwise, but it could be very difficult to live without one functioning limb, okay? Jacob lost a leg. A leg is, you need to get around. In those days, could you imagine? They didn't have wheelchairs. They didn't have comfortable cars. They didn't have anything built for people who are disabled. That's why it was so hard for them. But he lost a functioning leg. But what did he gain in the end of it? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Just like Jacob, when we try to run away from God to the best of our abilities by not coming towards him and saying, look, I messed up, Lord. I need to settle this with you. I need your help. I don't care how many times I fail. I need your help. I know I'm a hypocrite. I know I'm just, I'm just a bad Christian, maybe. I don't know. But I need your help because you told me, Lord, that a just man falls seven times and he gets back up again. Lord, you said you're going to accept me if I run away and come back. So I'm going to hold you to that promise and I'm just going to try to be better. 
But running away is not going to do you any good. You're, you're going to be a Jacob. You're going to be running all your life. And at the end, you're going to, you're going to reap whatever you sowed. And then what? And then you're just going to suffer the consequences. When in fact, if you had come earlier, maybe the Lord could have done something with you. Yeah. Now, the reason, the reason why the Lord chastises you is, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, is that he's scourging you because he's a son that you're a son that you, he received, right? Yeah. Well, well, thank God that he's chastising you. Yeah. If he doesn't chastise you, the Bible says you're a bastard. You have no father. That's right. yeah. So thank God you're being chastised. If you're still being chastised, praise God. Yeah. You're still in the family. He hasn't, he, hadn't, he hasn't gotten to the point where he says, you know what? I'm done with you. I'm sick of you. Yeah, how about that? Thank God you're being chastised. Amen. Thank God you've got some pain. Yes. It means he still considers you as a son. I think that's a blessing. Amen. Yes, sir. It's Amen. like a child running away from home when they mess up something, right? I thought about that when I was a kid. I, 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 man, I was doing something stupid. I had a, there was a little mallet, and, I, and it had a really thin leather string, and I was swinging it around, and then it just happened to fly out of my hand, and it made a hole in the drywall. And I thought I was just going to get, I, I thought I was going to die. My mom came home and I started crying. I was like, Mom, I just made a whole bunch of I'm going to die. Dad's going to kill me. It's like, oh, God, what am I going to do? And I was like, Mom, I got to run away. You gotta, I got to run away, Mom. I was like 10 years old, right? I was like 10 years old, okay? But I was scared because I, I didn't want my dad to have to go through, like, because I knew he worked hard. I didn't, have, I didn't want him to go through the struggle of having to pay for a stupid drywall thing and have him, have, have him get mad at me. And so when my dad came home, you know what happened? He's, my, I guess my mom told him how, how much I was afraid. <laughs> when, I, when, he, when he got home, my, my dad said, hey, son, look, mistakes happen. That's okay. It's good that you repented of it, that you made up for it, but that's okay. Let me fix that. I'll fix that up. You don't have to worry about that. But I'm glad you felt bad about what you did. When you come to God and you feel bad about what you did, when you have a repentant heart, he will not cast you out. Wow. So don't run away from him. Yes. You got a chance today. You got a chance for the rest of today to not run away from God. That's good. Amen. My last point is that running prevents blessing. Maybe the Lord wants you to get right so that he can bless you. Maybe you have, it's, it's like, just imagine the Lord having like a, I just imagine the Lord having a fishing line and he's kind of just, He's wheeling in a little bit every time you sin, and then he lets the wheel down, and he's, it's like right there, and then you sin, and he's like, oh, I can't give it to you now. He's wheeling it back up. Maybe it's like it's right here, and you're just you're smelling the blessing. You're, it's right there, and he's about to just drop it in your mouth, and you're about to have that nice blessing, and then you, you mess up, and the Lord's like, oh, I can't give it to you now. Look, kid, if you had just, just fixed this, and I can get you. I can get you that blessing. Look, I don't like chastising my sons. I don't think any father likes chastising their sons. I, I, I hope he don't. That, I don't know. I think that's kind of problematic, but I hope he don't like chastising your children. I don't think the Lord does either. I, he wants to bless you, but you've got to get right. You've got to fix yourself. So what happened to Jacob at the end? Well, he became a prince with God, and he has power with God and with men. There is hope for you. There is hope for sinners. Yeah. There is hope for saved, sinning Christians. Yeah, if you have the courage to get right and yeah. stop running. Amen. That's all I got. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 8. Ephesians 5 and verse 8. Amen. So the scripture reads, And be not drunk with wine, wherein excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now the Bible clearly states that we as Christians must not be drunk with wine, and immediately it tells us to be filled with the Spirit. So, Brother Joe, if you have a huge barrel the size of me, you should drink that if it's full of the Spirit. Amen? <laughs> you should do that. Amen. Do not touch wine. And I would like to assume that no one in this church has a problem with wine. Okay? I would like to assume that. And I hope that's the case. But I'd like to take that sinful thing, that ungodly thing that's called alcohol, and replace it with your sin that you keep secret, that no one knows about. 
And I'm going to have you really think about this, okay? Really, really consider when you're doing that sin and you keep it to yourself and, oh, no one knows about it when I do it by myself. Well, no, someone does know about it. Amen. Someone does know. In fact, there's two. There's two people that know about it, and we'll talk about that. But I'm going to give you uh, personal examples in my life on what happens when you get so comfortable with that sin that something's going to happen to you, okay? So the title of my message is, what's your alcohol? What's your alcohol? That's the title of my message. My first point is, wandering in sin, or wandering in alcohol. So there's this guy I knew a long time ago. Uh, he was a very, uh, uh, let's say it's a person that everyone would like. You know, he was uh, somebody that all the girls want to be with, all the guys want to be. And he went to this college, and he was very successful there. But uh, one day, he went to this party. It was out in the wilderness. It was in the forestry area. And you know, everyone got drunk, and they're having a good time. And what happened was that he got lost. He got in the forest. And everybody left him there. So what happened is that, essentially, he was there. And you know, he was all drunk, having a good time. Go to Proverbs 12 real quick. Go to Proverbs 12. And he's having a good old time by himself. You know, oh man, oh, this is so amazing. Oh, having all this greenery here. Oh, wow, this is Mother Nature. Wow, this is so awesome. So I go to Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. Go to Proverbs 14. And also put your hand up Proverbs 16. Proverbs 14 and Proverbs 16. Pastor Fernandez talked about this. Verse 12. The Bible reads, Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now go to Proverbs 16. Verse 25, it reads, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What I, uh, what I feel to tell you is that he was frozen to death. They found his body. Wow. So, you know what, so you know what that means? Here's him. Oh, wow. I'm so full of this alcohol, this sin that I love. Oh, here's a tree. Oh, man. It's so nice. So oblivious to... No pain, and oh man, mm. I get to enjoy this. Mm. Yeah, man, it's so nice. Little does he know, later that night, he's going to die. Now go to Job. Go to Job. Go to Job, chapter 12. Go to Job, chapter 12, verse 24. And, out of, and there comes that moment when he realizes he's all by himself. And he has that fear, that moment. Hello? Anybody? Can you help me? Hello? Hello? I'm scared. I need help. I'm getting cold. Please, somebody help me. No one's there. He's all by himself. Wow. In his sin. Wow. No one can hear him. You know what else? Go to Job 12, verse 24. Job 12, verse 24. This is something that's very scary. He take, so verse 24, He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. Even if you're a child of God, at one point, God is going to look at you and say, I have enough of your foolishness. You kept on ignoring my precepts, my commandments. You ignored my son. You ignored the spirit inside of you. I told you every single time in the scripture to stop doing the sin and you kept doing it. Enough. You're done. Come home. Unfortunately for this guy that I knew, not for him. Burning in hell. Not saved. That's where he is. Man. Christian, sometimes if you get offended by the preaching, that's good. Yeah. That means there's something inside of you that's telling you, you got to get right with this. Yeah, or one day God's going to call you up. And you could have done something for the church or something with your family, but no. You love sin more than you love God. That's scary. That should terrify you. My second point is vomiting in alcohol or vomiting in your sin. Now, there's another story of a guy that I knew. Uh, so this was actually somebody that uh, in high school, he wasn't really a, drug at, really a drug addict or an alcoholic. But when he got into college, much like peer pressure, when you get around lost people, and this is what I appreciate about in Brethren is that I don't feel like I'll be around sin. I don't feel like you guys are going to tempt me with sin. When I was in the world, oh man, you talk about wicked people, man. I knew guys that were, oh, I won't, I won't even get into it. Um, but here's this kid, okay? 
full ride scholarship, you know, really smart, just top, top of the line, really educated. Goes to a party. Everybody is peer pressuring him to do this and do that, and he does it. You know what happened? They take him to his room. He's drunk out of his mind. And hey, well, you know, we, we had him on the side of it on his couch. You know, we thought he was okay. But they found him the next day. He was laying on his back and he drowned in his own vomit. Oh. Go to Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, verse 11. That's what happens when you get full of your sin. Proverbs 26, verse 11. Proverbs 26, verse 11. The scripture reads, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Yeah. You go to Second Peter. Go to Second Peter. Sorry, 2 Peter chapter 2, read verse 22. Same, same kind of mind. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that washed to her wallowing in the mire. You know what the word wire me, mire means in the 1828? It means to sink in mud. Or to sink so deep as unable to move forward. You know what happens when you get stuck in your sin? You get so stuck to the point to where you feel like, oh, it's so nice. I don't want to move. But you don't realize that when you're in that position, what's happening is that in your body, the spirit is telling you, you got to stop. You got to stop. You got to stop. It's going to take over you. You're going to get over. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And then the spirit goes away. Not, you're not, you don't get away from the spirit. You're still saved. You're still saved. But the spirit's quenched. And you can't hear him. And then finally, that day comes when you thought everything was fine. You thought everything was okay. Uh-huh. No one knew anything. And then you're dead. Man. Just like that. All the vomit comes up on you, and that's your sin. And finally, that everybody sees what you've done. Yeah. Here comes the funeral, and they, they get to hear how you die. He was full of sin. And you profess to be a Christian. Wow. And then here comes pastor, tries to give them the gospel message. And they say, oh, what? I'm not going to listen to him. If that's, if that's his pastor, then I mean, I'm, wow. bunch of lies. That's scary. I do not want to have that on me. If you got something in your closet that you are keeping a secret, that you're keeping under the rug and under the radar, just remember that the Holy Spirit and God knows. He knows that you have that sin. Don't ever think for a second that just because you're not letting pastor know, you're not letting your brother know, your sister know, your wife know, your family know, your cousin, whoever, whoever you want to call out, God and the Holy Spirit knows. And if they know, that's more than enough. You should be scared of that. Go to Ephesians 6. Go to Ephesians 6. You know what's scary is that, one, uh, going back to the second point, is that I actually, before, before I got saved, uh, I was wicked. I uh, actually had the same experience. Um, I got so drunk at this party one time that I, got, I blacked out. And what, I, what told me was, was that a friend of mine, he said, yeah, man, you were just so gone that you just started vomiting all over yourself. And we thought you were dead because you just didn't move. And so what they did is that they picked me up, which, again, imagine my size, someone picking me up. It took them about six people. Uh, so... And I'm laid on the couch and someone's telling me that. And my first thought was, oh man, I'm going to do that again. Let's see if we can go around two. See, that's how crazy sin is, is that sin will take you so deep into filthiness that you think it's okay. And it'll make you do it over and over and over again. And that's what God sees. He sees you in sin and cycle. And when that happens, he doesn't want you to be in there. He wants you to get out. You're a new creature in God. You're not the old man anymore. You're the new man. So Ephesians 6, and this is what will help you to gird yourself from that. Okay, Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God. 
Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take in you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherein ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The only way that this could possibly not work is that if you take this off yourself. Yeah. That is the only way. Yeah. The only way that the devil can get one little inch in you is that if you let him get that inch. You cannot, at under, um, under any circumstances, waver. And I know it's going to be hard, especially in these last days. We got, Amen. I mean, we got tech. I mean, the online people, it's amazing you guys are watching this. But Amen. you're watching this, and you got to understand, the moment you stop seeing this, you're going to get a video that's going to be contradicting pastor's teachings on Mike Fernandez, Pastor Mike Fernandez. Don't be looking at that. Stay away from that. That's the Amen. devil. Amen. Trust in God, and do not trust you. <laughs> That'll be it. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm not feeling very well, so let's see how this happens here, right? Yeah. Right, glory and infirmities, right? Amen, right? All right, all right, all right. First Corinthians 15 and go to verse 20. Uh, I'm going to be a little short on time, so excuse the quick talking. That's what we got videos for, okay? Don't be lazy. Go back and watch it if you don't get what I'm saying, okay? First Corinthians 15 and go ahead to verse 20 here. I'm going to read real quick, all right? I hear the pages turning. But verse 20, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, that they, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. All right, let's go, to pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, dear Lord. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's the stomach ache or if it's I'm, I'm scared right now, Lord, but I, I, I'm nervous as, as probably I've ever been, Lord. So help me calm down, Lord. Uh, set, me, set me aside, Father, and just fill me with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and, and uh, feed your people. Uh, I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, pray, amen. All right, all right. So, um, so, so what I was thinking about when I was reading this, right, was that, um, you know, we got into a vineyard that already has had some bad husbandmen here. The other husbandmen, I'm listening to me a minute ago. Um, the other husbandmen were, were unfaithful and they killed the people that were supposed to come and get the fruits when the Lord wanted the fruits, right? So we got into that vineyard, okay? We already saw what they did with the words of God, okay? Now, when I was thinking about this, what did Cain say? say what did Cain say when God came to him am I my brother's keeper am I my brother's keeper well I want you to know in God's vineyards are the brothers and sisters as plants as fruits as seeds all over the vineyard all over the Bible you'll see um, um, you know types of, of plants and plant work like that related to your brothers and sisters so I want to give you a little message talking about Joy in the vineyard. Joy when you're keeping a vineyard and when you're keeping a brother, right? So my first thing here, right? What did Cain say, right? Am I my brother's keeper, right? Are you, are you praying for your brothers and sisters? We just heard that there's some secret sins going on here, brothers and sisters. And we don't want to hear it, honestly. I don't want to know what you're doing back there. But you know what? I better be watching myself that what? That I do not sin against the Lord in not praying for the brethren. Right? That's 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. Samuel said that was a sin, all right? So if you're not praying for your brothers and sisters, you're in sin right now, okay? You need to get that right. But bless God. Bless God. We have a holy God there, right? When you turn back. All right, son, come on in. Let's go. Let's get you back in the work. Let's get you back in the vineyard. Go to Song of Solomon. Go to Song of Solomon and verse 1. 
Let's get you back in that vineyard. How hard should you work? How hard should you work when you get back in that vineyard? You should work so hard that you become a black person. That's how good, that's how hard you should work. Right, brother? Amen. Verse 5. Verse 5. First Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 5. I am black. <laughs> I am black but comely, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Watch this. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard kept, ha have I not kept. You got to be in that field so long, the sun turns you darker. My grandpa was my skin color, and I didn't know that until I went to his house one day and he was taking his boots off and I saw his feet that looked just like my skin color. But my grandpa from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m., he worked that field and he went from picking grapes in the field where he got 25 cents a tray, making $180 a day. You do the math, right? He went from doing that to doing the mayor's, the mayor's uh, uh, gardens and all of that. The Lord took him all of that. And what did the Lord do be in that time? My grandfather was a drunk. He was a drunk, he was a, a bad husband, and he was not a good man. But, my, but, but the Lord Jesus Christ saved him. And he said, he said, hey, hey, get out of the grapevine. Get out of there. Let me put you in the mayor's atrium. What? What? Let me put you in, the, in, the, in his atrium and pick his roses, right? And that's how hard you need to work. You need to work so hard that your skin starts, your skin starts turning another color. Yeah, that's, that's how hard you need to have. That's how much you need to stay in this Bible. That, that God starts changing you. You start looking like a black person when you're white, right? And if you're white, well, then you got, and if you're black, and you start looking like a white person. Either way, the Lord needs to change you. That sun needs to look upon you, brethren. That's what needs to happen. That's how hard you got to work. Get back to work. Get in the vineyard. Get in the vineyard. And what am I talking about getting in the vineyard? Well, pray for your brothers and sisters as well. That's what I'm talking about. Get around them. Spend some time with them. Spend some time thinking about them. Hey, brother, I'm not good at praying. That's why we give you a prayer list. Oh, man, watch and pray. Watch that list and pray to the Lord Jesus Christ and see what he'll do, brethren. Okay, that was my second point. Uh, I, <laughs> And how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel and, right, and bring glad tidings of good news, right? Oh, man, right? I was thinking about my grandpa's feet when I read that on there, right? Okay, Song of Solomon 4. Go to Song of Solomon 4. And so you're working so hard. You're working so hard, right? And you're saying, you're saying oh, Lord, I'm, I, I'm black now. Don't look upon me. I've been working so hard. I'm sweaty. I'm sweating right now, right? And... Hey, don't look upon me. But what does the Lord say? He doesn't see that. He doesn't see your, all your struggles. He doesn't see your, your blackness. What does he say there? It's not even in chapter 4. It's in chapter 1, verse, uh, boom, 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 boom. I know that, that fairly, blah, 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 blah. It is, behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove eyes, right? That's how the Lord sees you, right? He sees you beautiful. I was looking for a, I was looking for a verse there. Oh! Ah, chapter 4 verse 7 bless God the Bible says thou art all fair my love there is no spot in thee the Lord doesn't even see it brethren he doesn't even see all those little struggles right why why right because he purchased you as a wife and washed you with the regeneration right oh glory to God glory to God and he brought you in as a wife as a wife just like her right Oh, man, glory to God. And then what else happens there in chapter 4, right? What is, wow, how is, man, this is so beautiful. Look at this. Look at this. Look what the Lord is using to describe her beauty. Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. That hair is as the flock of goats that appears from the mountain Gilead, right? So what do you, what do you keep besides the vineyard? You also goats. You also keep sheep. Look at this. Thy, thy teeth are like the flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing where of every one bears twins and none is barren among them. Go to verse 11. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under, the tongue, under thy tongue and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are as an orchard of pomegranates and thy... 
talking about the same place she was hanging out in all the time. He's using her surroundings, all of the work she was doing. Listen, brothers and sisters, it's going to be hard to change your thought life and your prayer life if it's not been good. But all of that work that you spend to change your life, God's going to use that to describe your beauty. That's going to make you more beautiful to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to make you more precious. My feet stink, but the Lord says it smells good and it's beautiful. Amen. Oh, glory to God. And you know what, brethren? Get in it. I don't even remember the end of it. But, man, this is so good because the Lord Jesus Christ, he is trying to do a mighty work in our lives right now. And he knows how hard it's going to be, brethren. He knows it's how hard it's going to be. But you know what? He doesn't see the sweat. He doesn't see all this tiredness and all of that. He just sees a beautiful wife. Ready, ready, ready to come up to heaven. And ready, ready to get married, ready to go to a nice, nice dinner. You don't show up to the dinner party all sweaty. You show up looking nice, right? Praise God. Amen. That's all I got. Amen. Wow.